Cybus Projects and our conversation, Systems of Solidarity, the Urgency of Socially Engaged Practice. I'm Nina Malhall. I'm the Program Coordinator here at BUS. <laughs> so thank you for um, And I develop our education and community programs here. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on which we meet tonight, the Wurundjeri people and the elders past and present of the Kulin Nations. We feel this conversation is a timely one to have uh, with these organisations, researchers and practitioners to knowledge share and to reflect upon the crucial importance of community and socially engaged practices. Uh, this conversation comes at an urgent time, so much soon after the announcement of the uh, closure of the Centre for Cultural Partnerships at the Victorian College of the Arts, but also at a time of increased importance in this field of socially engaged practices around the world. Co-chairing today we have Amy Spears and David Cross. Amy is a Melbourne-based artist and writer who makes participatory, socially engaged and public art. She is currently a PhD candidate at the Centre for Cultural Partnerships at the VCA, where she is investigating public and participatory arts, ability to contest prescribed notions of community in place and offer new, destabilising insights. Her study aims to rethink what a valuable artistic social engagement could constitute. Uh, David works as an artist, curator and writer his practice extends across performance, installation, sculpture, public art, and video. He has exhibited extensively across Europe, North America, and Australasia. As a curator, he developed with Claire Doherty, One Day Sculpture, 20 public artwork works across New Zealand in 2009. Iteration, again, 13 public art projects across Tasmania in 2011, and treatment at Western Treatment, Western Treatment Plant in 2015. In 2016, he convened the Melbourne Biennale Lab with Claire Doherty for the City of Melbourne and is currently developing the cultural strategy for the new Melbourne Metro Tunnel. David is the Professor of Art and Performance at Deakin. Joining them, our speakers tonight are Will Foster, who is an artist and curator based in Melbourne. His projects have taken form as temporary public artworks, large-scale messages, investigative social spaces, exhibitions, research networks, and socially engaged pedagogical programs. Will has carried out major projects around the world and is the founder and co-director of the Wasteland 20 Network, Cabin Exchange, and a Centre for Empathy. Timothy Moore is the direct, a director of Sibling Architecture in Melbourne and is currently the editor of Future West. He has worked at architecture firms in Amsterdam and Berlin and worked as an, an editor for two influential architecture magazines, Volume and Architecture Australia, along with the zine, They Shoot Homos, Don't They? Nureni Julia Studi is a co-founder and director of the Kunshi Cultural Studies Centre in Georgia, Indonesia, an, organisa an organisation aiming at advancing a wider critical movement to cultural issues through popular education practices and experimental approaches. Uh, we have a recording to show you uh, with Vanessa Klein, who had a conversation with our director Shannon earlier in the week. She is a Vancouver-based artist, writer and curator. As an artist, her work has involved the production of work in public space and has developed a practice that is often collaborative, site-specific and interdisciplinary. She currently works as the curator of community engagement with Front Gallery, where she produces socially engaged work and special projects and as a producer curator with other sites for artists' projects and organisation that commissions temporary artworks for the public realm. Uh, Tian Wei Woon was also meant to be Skyping in with us this evening, but is unable to, so he has written a letter of solidarity, <coughs> which Shannon will be posting online later this evening and alongside the video that we'll be publishing. So Tian is an artist and curator who works and lives in Singapore. He is the co-founder of the Cultural and Social Collective Post Museum. His practice can be seen as collaborations between himself and other individuals, organisations and collectives. So that's our speakers. And with that, I'll hand it over to you guys. Thanks, Nina. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's so great to be in a packed space, a hot, sweaty space, which seems appropriate for some of the territory we're going to cover tonight. Uh, I'm delighted to have these people on the stage here. What Amy and I were thinking that we would do is begin maybe with some, some introductory framing of some of the contexts that we would like to grapple with tonight, and then move along our distinguished guests on the stage to either talk to a particular aspect of some of the things we wanted to frame, 
or to talk about some of their practices. And I know that um, Will and Timothy, for example, have just delivered really interesting commissions at the Melbourne Biennial Lab at the Queen Victoria Market. So it may be an opportunity to try and pick up on how your projects have, have responded to some of the content we want to deal with tonight. Uh, and we also have that, that video presentation which will kick in. So uh, to begin with, I think there's a number of things that are really kind of absolutely salient about where we want to go tonight. On one level, the conversation is picking up on the extreme anxiety that has underpinned the closure of CECP at the University of Melbourne. And Amy has a very particular and direct engagement with it, but I know a number of people in the audience do as well. And I think following hot on the heels of that is the American political election of just over a week ago. And the fact that those two events seem to be, or potentially could be construed as being part of a continuum of a kind of rupture or, or a chasm that is existing at the moment in the relationship between the notion of socially engaged art practice, the radicality of that model of art practice, and a pushback effect that seems to be happening, whether it's through Brexit, whether it's through the rise of Pauline Hanson, whether the, it, the issues of the closure of the CCP are somehow connected to a continuum, whether those things are in fact somehow slightly separated from one another. But I think um, Amy will pick up the threads of it in a moment, but what I was really interested in tonight was to think about the nature of this idea of agency as artists. We are living in very challenging times. And at the same time, the kind of practice that we all value on this stage is a practice that's very fundamentally about social engagement, it's about community connections, it's about the idea of celebrating a notion of complexity, which was something I talked about at M Pavilion last week. And the, the, the issue of how or to what degree that is under attack is probably one of the salient things of us describing tonight. So the fact that this community is here together tonight to either A, celebrate the nature of us as a community, to push back against the kind of nascent stupidity of the closure of the CCP. I should acknowledge I work for a different university, but I was just saying to Amy before that it's not as if any one university can somehow be seen as separate from one another. They are all part of a kind of series of processes around neoliberalism, which seems to be pushing against this notion of complexity, diversity, the celebrations of some of the kind of more radical politics that I think underpin the nature of what the CCP was all about. The other thing I wanted to say by way of introduction is that it's really easy for us to get bogged down in definitions. So people can talk a whole raft about social engaged practice, or they can talk about politics, or they can talk about anything. I really encourage us tonight to not fall into the trap of being definitionally sort of stultified, and try and keep this as an opportunity to think through the nature of creativity and creative practice and what that means now, and what, what it means as us as a community, and what are the strategies around which we need to think about pushing back against what we can quite clearly see evidentially is a, a, a massive shift away from the celebrations of ideas of diversity and complexity that I think is the staple features of the things that we all believe in. Mm -hmm. So we are in a really complex space. You know, whether, we, whether we're back in the early 70s as a counterculture, whether we're back in the 89 period with the collapsing of the Berlin Wall and the shift of communism and capitalism, Whatever it is that we are in, it's still so fresh to us, we don't quite know. But what is really clear is that there are many forces of darkness, many forces of, of populism that have been pushed against the nature of us as creative people. So I'm interested tonight not to put pressure on the three people on the stage, but I'm really interested in thinking through what is it that we need to be doing? What formations do we need to be building? What kinds of modalities of political art practice do we need to be engaging with in order to find a way of of short-circuiting the reality that we now find ourselves in. So that's probably my intro spiel. Over to you, Spearsy. All right, uh, so <laughs> I'm Spearsy. Um, I, I'm doing a PhD at the Centre for Cultural Partnerships. <coughs> I'm also a casual staff member, so I kind of talk from both sides of the closure. If you guys don't know, um, it, it is a little-known centre at the Victorian College of the Arts, but it was a uh, quickly... Um, growing and exciting centre at the VCA that basically got kneecapped just as it was, um, it was taking off. But basically the Centre for Cultural Partnerships has been at the VCA for about 12 years. You may not know this. And, and its background was teaching sort of um, community cultural development um, and training artists to kind of go out into communities. And uh, So in more recent history, Centre for Cultural Partnerships has been teaching artists 
um, from you know from the, the broader areas of community arts and socially engaged practice. Socially engaged practice being the more the, the more recent buzzword that we use to talk about this kind of practice. But generally, for me, um, it's it's been interesting since the closure of the centre because we realised it was closed because the powers that be that that ran VCA didn't quite understand it. And it's quite fascinating to suddenly find yourself having to validate and, and um, describe what this practice is. And, and I've learned a lot um, through trying to advocate for the practices that we work in. Um, specifically, um, thinking about well, what currently does VCA, for instance, support? So they're basically, basically the faculty cut our centre thinking that Community arts and socially engaged art is happening across the faculty already. So for instance, in theatre, there are people who are doing community um, engagement. People at the art school are doing community engaged practice. And what we've learned from these sorts of discussions is that there, there seems to be an, a, a thought that, you know, artists, proper professional artists make, you know, gallery art or theatre art and occasionally they might dabble in public or community arts practice. Mm. And what we've started trying to say to the, the faculty is actually, no, this is a specialised practice of its own, with its own histories, its own theories, and its own methodologies. And f for instance, someone like me makes primarily socially engaged art in places that are not like in conventional galleries or in conventional theatres, but you know, goes and finds audiences that are outside of the, the usual spaces. And that is my primary pa practice. Um, you know, I've signed up to thinking about artists like Susan Lacey or Mel Lederman Eucles or Jeremy Della, these people who are not, you know, who will have a gallery practice, but that's their side practice, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. So, um, so for us, we've been quite dismayed by the Centre for Cultural Partnerships being closed. Um, uh, specifically, they've cut specialised staff and people like me who are... Um, in the final months of my PhD have basically been forced to find another supervisor in the, at the, the 11th hour and you know kind of being told here's a painter who can support you and you know like just being confronted with this reality of these people do not understand this practice um, you know I make art with refugees I make art with um, with white communities out of hanging rock trying to get them to confront um, you know uh, sort of their colonial legacy where all they want to do is um, think about Miranda and, and not about the absence of indigenous um, stories out of Hanger Rock. And, you know, working with people takes a certain amount of skills that, uh, a, you know, a painting lecture is not going to necessarily be able to help you with. Um, yeah, have I missed anything? I don't no, I don't think so. I, was just, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions before yep. we maybe open it out. Yeah. Sure. One of those questions is, and you, you've heard me ask this before, but I'm going to ask it in a public forum. Mm -hmm. If the CCP was called socially engaged art, it would still be here today. Do you think that's the case? Do you think that, in fact, when you have a term that is complex and rich, but not necessarily sitting in the nice closeted area of the art world, that that's the potential risk? That the art world's decided that if you don't have art in the title, effectively, you're not actually one of us. So is this something to do with a, a tiling exercise? What, what do you see as the underpinning aspect of this? Uh, I'm, okay, it's, it's a complex question. There's a number of things going on. VCA has cut uh, Centre for Cultural Partnerships uh, using the usual kind of neoliberal economic reasoning, like, oh, you weren't being economically viable. And one of the most, um, I think, problematic reasons was that there was a lack of demand for these courses and mm -hmm. frankly there is a huge demand for these courses uh, I mean you know e as evidenced by the people in this room um, but in terms of socially engaged art look I do feel like I'm the evil person in this and we were talking about this before I do represent the right kind of contemporary artist mm -hmm. you know I just had a show at mama or mm -hmm. I, you know I I you know I show in galleries yeah. and um, or, or Mona, you know. yeah Mona, yeah. I, yeah yeah and and I do tend to make a more critical community engaged practice that mm. perhaps gets more purchase in the contemporary art world. Um, what what bothers me is that Centre for Cultural Partnerships represented a huge spectrum of practice, mm. and you had people, for instance, um, uh, that. 
you know, the sort of people that say run um, Dreamtime for the G at the MCG. You know, they help facilitate sort of community ritual practice or bring people together around um, kind of community cohesive, like health and well-being projects. Stuff that I wouldn't necessarily sign up to myself, but I think that there is an important need for this 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 kind of ecology of practice. There needs to be a lot of different things going on at, at, the, at this point of time. And I do think that VCA had a sl certain amount of snobbery about the kind of practices that was going on there. They, they didn't necessarily think, think knit bombing was a practice they wanted to support. And I think we need to be worried about that when they start making value judgments about what this practice is about. Mm -hmm. and um, and some, some of the people weren't even artists. They were people that were doing some quite extraordinary, uh, what, what you would call transdisciplinary research. So they're bringing, say, uh, people who work in disability together with, say, um, technology to, to help people with disabilities encounter galleries. Mm. Um, you know, so it's, it wasn't even necessarily like art work, mm. but it was important work for the arts, mm. um, if, if I'm making sense. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, too, about the relationship between the CCP and what's happening more broadly, that I think we're detecting currently there is a, a, a backlash. There's clearly a backlash against what I'm calling complexity. You can call anything you like. Maybe it's a reaction against a certain kind of political agency that the supposed left has, has been able to develop. So we're seeing a lot of stuff recently about elites, like, like Malcolm Turnbull the other night on 7.30 report, the ABC is, a, is an elite, you know, and it's like, so he's now taken on the language of that extreme right wing, and like the way that Turnbull's now being positioned, he's kind of floating in the winds of this populism that seems to be becoming more and more of a respecter on top of us. I'm kind of interested in terms of your perspective on the relationship between what's happened to CCP and broader, geopolitical art events. Are these things connected or are we just seeing this as a kind of coincidence between Melbourne University's fundamental indifference to that program and what I think we're seeing globally, which is a backlash against what I'm calling complexity, but again, we could call it a lot of different things. I'm, I guess I'm asking you, what's the relationship between those two things? I, th I mean, I think it's interesting, for instance, Ben Eltham, um the journalist has sort of said that it has made quite a strong connection with the fact that the Sydney Biennale boycott um, happened and the cuts to the Australia Council. Mm -hmm. So I do think that artists who are working in, say, more political ways and um, more like active, kind of engaged ways do get people worried, perhaps. And I mean, perhaps you're seeing a rise of sort of practices that engage with politics and with community because of the kind of dire situation we, we find ourselves kind of slipping into. It just seems to get worse and worse and worse. And artists are wanting to react with that. Mm. I mean, I know, like, for instance, Claire Bishop writes in Artificial Hells that the, the rise in participatory practice seems to happen at every, every time there's a crisis in politics. Mm. So we're definitely facing one of those crises in politics where participatory uh, engaged art practices are kind of coming again to the fore, and then I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I feel uncomfortable about, for instance, the connection between the Sydney Biennale boycott and cuts to the arts. But there, like you say, I think there is a sort of a, a, a continuum, mm -hmm. and we're doing things that perhaps both like bother people, mm -hmm. um, particularly kind of conservative forces. Um, but we should take that as a, a badge of honour and keep bothering them. Yeah. But the fact is we've always done that, yeah. and yet something feels different now. I'm really curious to pull that back into the audience later on. I, I feel something different now. I'm 48, so I'm not a spring chicken, and I've been in the caper for a long time. But I have felt profoundly different in the last two weeks in a way I've never felt before. It's like something is transpiring, something is shifting and pivoting in our world, and the kinds of critical rich practices that you embody and other people on this panel have embodied feels like it's coming under attack by a sustained uh, kind of uh, surveillance mechanism, whether it's the media, whatever it is, it feels like something's shifted. Now, I could be wrong and maybe people disagree with that. It's, something's happening at the moment and the fact that the CCP has just been closed down at a time when we desperately need the richness of knowledge that surrounds community practice, socially engaged work, um, the issues that we have in our society across, you know, um, 
so many factors about immigration, about alienation, about lack of jobs for people. It's like these are the times around which socially engaged practice is absolutely needs to flourish. But it's the question of whether that's being picked off uh, as a means of, of shifting us away from the things that matter to focus on things that perhaps don't matter. I, I, look, I think in terms of VCA, the situation there is I think just actually incompetence. And if anyone's been like privy to behind the scenes, we've realised that they just cut us off because it seemed the most easiest thing to do. Mm. And they thought we'd go away quietly. What's hilarious is that you don't pick on the community artists. They're the ones who know about engaging community and getting active. And they're like quite literate in politics. Um, so I mean, it has been interesting that the VCAs found themselves kind of slightly embarrassed by the way that we fought back. And, um, and they're already kind of backtracking and saying, oh, look, we'll make some space for this practice in the future. Mm. Just trust us. We'll just cut CCP and then rebuild it on our own terms. So that's basically the idea that we are getting at the moment. But um, I don't know. I mean, in terms of the broader picture, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think we just need to keep making interesting work. I mean, I think my biggest problem with this attack, for instance, is I don't want to find myself defending whether this is a practice. Mm. I find that incredibly boring. Mm. My, the questions I want to be answering at the moment is, well, what kind of things should we be doing with this practice? What people should we be engaging? What, what kinds of politics should we be doing? I mean, if anyone no, who knows me well will know that I sort of come from a more critical perspective on socially engaged art, and I'm, I'm more for work that, that might provoke or challenge or disrupt audiences over help um, make them feel more comfortable, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of questions that are the debates I want to be having, not sure. whether this stuff should be supported. Totally. Yeah. And you very rarely frame it as art in the process of making the work with the audiences that you engage with. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I'm very rarely talking about making I think the reason that I asked that, Amy, was just that we haven't thrown the Sydney College of the Arts into the picture yet, but we should. Yeah. Because like one of the preeminent art schools in this country was attempted to be shut down by a Sydney university. And I think the CCP has come on the heels of that. So again, it's not like this is in isolation. We're seeing a kind of systematic reaction from academia, which has traditionally been the critic and conscience of society, to thinking that things like something like an art school is as incredibly powerful and important as the, let's call it the leading art school, even if it isn't, uh, in Sydney, to shut that down at a time where they want to basically close the National Art School. The CCP's followed on the footsteps of that. And interestingly, that the sort of reaction from SCA, the students at SCA were extraordinary, and they reversed that decision. The CCP have also been extraordinary, but you weren't successful in that. And I don't think that's in any way a measure of you or any of the people in this room who fought really, really diligently to try and shift that, that position. But there's something happening in that space. There's something happening in this country, and there's something happening internationally where I think those of us that work in academia are genuinely fearful that the kind of things that we feel, which is that universities are places of diversity, a celebration of complexity, and they have a separation from some of that uh, nascent politicisation that exists in the world, is also under attack. So this is a broader set of things that are in train, I think. Um, and I think it's important to see the CCP issue holistically in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's also student funding. That's been a major thing that's happened in the UK with, with cutting, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the ability to get funding to do art history, for example. Mm -hmm. um, which I think that, that that's kind of terrifying. That well, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's basically this kind of evidence of this erosion of the humanities. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, anything that doesn't seem to be like profitable seems to be cut, being cut, and that's the general story that we're seeing internationally. Is mm -hmm. that the arts is the first thing to get picked off. But um, philosophy departments, humanities departments are also under threat. Yeah. I mean, some, I think someone I read somewhere, some, someone's predicting that universities in the future will not have humanities departments. Mm. Yeah. Like, that's how bad it's got. Yeah. yeah. Um, do we want to throw over to Will now? Or, like, we could, we could keep going, but let's, yeah. let's <laughs> do that. Just to bring it. The one thing that I also just wanted to float before I passed to the panel was that Amy and I had a conversation before. Somebody talked about the conversa a topic called soft politics versus what might be kind of more kind of harder or nascent or activist or agitational politics. But I, I am really interested in the nature of what kind of political inflection is required at this point of time. And I don't know about the term soft politics, but I think it's going to come up in our presentation later on about exactly what that might mean. But 
I do think it's an interesting thing for us to tease apart a bit tonight what kind of political action and agency is required to deal with the circumstances we find ourselves in. So maybe we can leave that as a floating um, issue. And at this point, I would like to just move move down the line and like to work, um, welcome Will Foster to the conversation. Um, Will, did you want to respond to anything Amy and I said, or would you just genuinely like to talk more broadly about our, our topic um, area? No, I guess... I guess I, as an artist, I'm interested in when you have positions of leverage and when you can use that. And I guess um, I, I was thinking that uh, just talking about the recent project that um, we did for the Public Art Biennial Lab, um, that was quite a, um, I, I guess, um, quite open uh, to critique. And uh, because it was the first year, the inaugural project um, is very much a litmus test. And we felt like that we were um, kind of very much part of this experiment, which had its good points and its bad points. Um, but I think everyone was very ambitious, uh, very supportive of the amount of money that was being put into the project and the step that the city of Melbourne made and the people that they brought on to run that project. So that was really exciting. Um, but it was also, there was a lot of conversations around, I guess, around gentrification and about how we're com complicit in processes of development, um, that essentially you know, um, that, that Doyle had, had backed this, this project and um, that there was very interesting um, kind of, uh, I guess, political landscape in the, in the market and things were, were going to change in the market um, and that the market, be the Queen Victoria market became the election issue. Um, so we were interested in how can we work within that and how can we have leverage within that process and how can we um, kind of softly critique some of the politics around that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, what's fine. interesting, because I was also involved in that project, and mm. what's interesting coming into a project like that um, is that everyone has already been engaged and consulted to death on that, on that project in terms of the, the stakeholders, the people that work on the market. So yeah. what was interesting coming with Will and other artists and collectives was that actually um, be careful how you engage in a, in a way and what kind of engagement is needed. And sometimes, well, we sit when we, we do a lot of temporary architecture, and actually temporary architecture is the engagement. That is the way to test out what communities are there to form. So I found the biennial gave us that space in a way mm. to do that. Mm. Um, I wonder if you two might just talk a little bit for, for those that maybe either saw or maybe just could be helpful and refreshing, just a little bit about the project. So maybe, Will, if you talk about your engaged project and what it actually entailed, would be helpful just to unfold yeah. it. So I made a work with uh, Gabrielle Davitri as my partner and collaborator. Uh, called Visible Hands, um, which worked with 23 traders at the market, in which we looked at various hand gestures um, that related to the contested past, present and future of the market. Um, and uh, we wanted to make a work that was embedded in the market with traders so that they were um, performing, so to speak, um, while, while trading, and you would be kind of ping-ponged around the market and you would have this experience where um, the traders would evoke particular histories, um, for example, graveyard um, relating to the, the history of the site or development. Um, and you would, um, that would then culminate in uh, a, a game that was around, around gesture which you could interact with in the market. Um, and that was very much shaped by the people that we worked with. Um, it was, a, you know, a, a very fast turnaround of the project. I think one of the big reflections for the next um, lab that's going to happen is that they want to have at least a year around it. I mean, to make projects in four months at that, um, at that scale um, was quite uh, quite difficult, you know. Um, and also, we would have liked to have spent more time on the site. Um, but yeah, we, we spent a lot of time talking to talking to traders and, and developing that work with them as well. I'll talk about my work in a bit, but maybe coming back to one of David's points with the Biennial Lab about kind of the zeitgeist that we're living at the moment, all this kind of changing world that we find ourselves in. And what's interesting about the Boneyal Lab, um, a significant amount of the City of Melbourne's public art budget went into this project for two years. Yeah. And it's a very big risk. And I think what's interesting in we socially engaged art is that um, every local government wants engaged work, engaged practice, but when they get it, they actually get quite scared. And so it kind of gives you this, um, and I've also, with Sibling, we've also managed public art projects, delivered public art projects, I've consulted a lot in government as well. And it's this kind of paradox, and it's kind of exciting to work with them as well, is that every local government wants 
an artist to engage with different communities, whatever that community is, wants you to engage, but then when you deliver that, there's a risk. And a classic example, I was delivering a public art project for another artist in a, a growth area, and um, a newspaper article came out about another public art work, and then they told us to hold the project because everyone was scared about this project, so, but we still had to do community engagement at the same time. So I find this an interesting paradox in a way that they're still demanding socially engaged art, or what they think they know is socially engaged art, mm. but not exactly how we talk about it, I find. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, I mean, our work became completely fueled by the idea of what we were and were not allowed to say. Um, and I think that was really interesting, really interesting for groups like, like, like Field Theory and the work that they made as well. Mm. You know, giving a platform for traders to be able to talk about um, anything they wanted on radio, on a, a radio station that ran for um, 9,000 minutes, referencing the 9,000 bodies in the market. Um, and, uh, but then having restrictions on what they were able to talk about because it was during the caretaker period, um, just before the elections. So, you know, this, I, I get really excited by that. And I think what kept us actually going in the project and quite a few of the artists was this friction, you know, that actually made it a lot more interesting um, to work in. So, yeah, you're kind of critiquing the very thing that you were invited to kind of support, I guess. Mm. Um, I think it's interesting that you were both placed into a, the most contested site you could possibly be <laughs> with the most ridiculous timeline I've ever seen. And most ridiculous <laughs> history. Yeah, and, and, and then, yeah, with a model that wasn't completely immaculate, and I can say that having been involved yeah. in it. But the storeholders at the Vic Market were incredibly dubious of what you were doing. Mm -hmm. You, they thought you were ring-ins, they thought this was all part of Doyle's kind of cultural agenda to kind of use it as a veneer, to camouflage some of those political transformations did that you, you want to do. Did you ever actually get that opinion, conversation? Because I thought, I, I got ready for, I got my defence ready for those conversations, they never came forward for me. Really? Um, but yeah, interesting. But I would also think that a lot of others, maybe the market holders didn't think like that, but a lot of other stakeholders see art as placemaking embellishment. So yeah. even if um, people within the core group didn't understand it. That I'm sure the reason that project got up partly was because some people thought that was the project. Yeah. So. But, but the, the broader point I wanted to make, and just to try and bring it back into the bigger context, was that I think both of your projects were profoundly successful, but the stakes that were running against them were so massive. Mm. Timelines, budgets, incredibly fractious group of people at the market, and a renewal process right in the middle of an election where you're not allowed to talk about it. Yeah. I can't imagine, it's like a cannon rolling around on a wet deck. Yeah, and to be placed in that space, but to, at the same time, to have the kind of response that the storeholders ultimately had to your projects, that it really was profoundly gratifying for them, that you, you, you treated them with the, the care and respect that you did, and the projects had a kind of resonance they did. And Timothy, your project was a very strongly politically engaged project, and yet it was still extremely well received. And I think the, what I'm trying to get at here is that there is a really interesting mechanism around which artists have a capacity for an enormous complexity of, of difficulties mm -hmm. to still be able to find a means by which the work has an aesthetic and a critical and a political value within that space. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put that out there that I think, I'm not trying to pump your tyres up, but I am <laughs> suggesting that it was a very successful approach in a very difficult space. Yeah, I mean, I mean with the project itself, it was, um, we call it over obelisk, so there's an um, obelisk at the corner of the Vic Market, which is dedicated to John Batman, they put it on his grave about 25 years after his death, and it says on the obelisk that Melbourne was unoccupied prior to 1835. And the city of Melbourne put a plaque on it in the early 90s uh, with consent to say that um, it may be inaccurate what the monument says, but it's a really small plaque that you can't can't notice it. So we engaged in a project that looks like temporary hoarding around the monument and asks you to um, ask you the question, do you acknowledge that the historical events are inaccurate? So we blow up the text from the plaque from the city of Melbourne. And then we had two follies that kind of merged out from it. And um, we wanted people to respond to that question and actually, um, when we were installing that, a few people were quite angry with us because uh, one person identified as John Batman's descendant and wanted, was wanting, wanting to know what we are doing to the, uh, the heritage or history of, of John Batman. And when I told her, and this is kind of the power of temporary architecture, I reckon, in a way, is that we just told it was temporary and it wasn't permanent. And she was like, oh, it's okay then, it's just temporary. <laughs> and I kind of like that, you know, Trojan horse attitude there. And then we had another guy come up and we were installing and he just came up and he, had, he was like, late 60s, early 70s, I would say, and he, call, he pulled out this 
texter out of his back and just wrote no. And, and so he didn't agree. He, he, he think, and I, so he didn't see us then. We kind of identified who we were and we said, oh, so uh, do you think that Melbourne was unoccupied prior to 1835? And he said, yeah, it was unoccupied. And then we got into this conversation. Um, we respectfully listened to him and heard what he had to say, but it got to a point where it was upsetting and we had to um, say, okay, we're going to disagree. He did come back a few weeks later and graffitied again uh, as, as well but this is, you know this is the potential of the work in a way and yeah. for us um, for sibling working outside of our usual architecture practice is to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations to actually have our work form some kind of community um, and have the project be that engagement as well and I would say this is also where the, the research comes in or training of artists who who can kind of know how to respond mm. to that yes. situation you know like I think that it, the more you work in public the more you realize there are going to be people who tear down the work or mm. strongly refute it or whatever but how can you kind of embrace that sort of engagement and and, and make it visible within the work or at least make mm. it part of it you know, something that you talk about, it's not a failure of the work that someone wrote, no, it's actually a, an engagement. Mm -hmm. um, but, this, I mean, I, I would say that these are the key skills that someone who works in a socially engaged public mm -hmm. art way kind of recognises these sorts of moments of tension as productive and generative. Mm -hmm. It's a really great point. And those skills are not something that are inherent or that you can mm -hmm. just try and pull out of the bag. These are skills that something that you are very familiar with. CCP is actually thinking through the nature of how does one negotiate the complexity of a community, how does one deal with antagonism or agonism, uh, how, how can those things be in fact incorporated so it doesn't close the work or discredit the work, but it becomes part of the meaning of the complexity of the public that exists in relationship to it. Should we bring in Nunning? Because I can yeah. see you nodding your head, maybe you want to <laughs> contribute on that conversation. Um, my response would be um, different from the other speakers here, given my background. Uh, I'm just going to start uh, from the project that Kunti has just started called School of Improper Education and trying to explain some ideas around it and try to build an argument that um, school or studying in this case can also be perceived as a, as a way of creating solidarity but uh, I want to extend the meaning of solidarity to an extension of care, like building a network of care. Um, so uh, again, we starting from this year, we are planning to build a school called School of Improper Education, which was initially called uh, School of invisible economies. Uh, we are going to experiment with the notion of study and use our experiment alternative pedagogies and, and use that to move deeper into uh, various issues like land conflict and immaterial labor and non-monetary transactions something that has connection with uh, our past projects, uh, comments. Uh, but we are also, as we are preparing the idea of this school, we were uh, thinking about uh, Kunji as an organization, like uh, how are we going to you know, perceive the idea of school. What do we mean by school? And uh, do we mean that? Um, is creating a school uh, like a continuation of our attempt at fixing the, like fixing what has been broken or like paying the debt or something that uh, like fixer because like what Adi Dharmawan of Wang Rupa said of seeing uh, organization like Kunji as an alternative space like or is this just uh, our just another initiative from us like creating a uh, new infrastructure mm -hmm. because we also see ourselves as a new kind of infrastructure because as we are trying to 
you know, filling the loopholes and we are more and more becoming like an infrastructure. And so we think about that, but we also think about uh, our own practices. So we are 17 years old now, and there are, there are, uh, we were thinking of moments of becoming and also un unbecoming. Uh, we feel like there are a lot of things that uh, we have done, but also uh, still there are things that uh, needs to be done. And we see uh, other alternative spaces just like us or other artist initiatives keep flourishing in Indonesia. Uh, we see you know, the rise of uh, Muslim orthodoxy. We see uh, different ways which shapes our you know, the culture of productions through residencies, travels. Uh, more people come to Jogja. We travel more than we were before. Uh, exchanges, residencies, and we meet uh, more and more collaborators. And we see that uh, participatory art becomes um, part of the, you know, the edginess of the practices. Mm -hmm. And we, we question uh, what does it mean to do it today in a context like Indonesia. And uh, well, at the same time, we see that Jogja is also uh, is increasingly changing, overpopulated visually crowded and we see new challenge, gentrification and so uh, this is uh, there are new organizations uh, focusing on rights to the city emerge so uh, we, we think a lot about that and we as we are trying to think about uh, what could be done next uh, but we, are, we found that we are, as we are thinking of what could be done next, we also think about actually our own future. Like uh, how can we sustain? And also how do we value what we are having today, like the material and also the material aspects of our con conditions. And also if you talk about community, um, uh, what community that actually we speak for. So we talk about that and also we think a lot about the idea of, of school. Uh, what do we mean by school and what do we mean by, by, by studying? And at the same time we also, uh, as a collective, we 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 growing old. Uh, we, we come of age. Uh, as the organization is also uh, at growing, we have uh, we all of us have personal decisions, uh, different personal paths. But at the same time, we also want to become part of it. So and I so we began to see uh, Unchis project as not only just project but also our way of. Uh, thinking together mm -hmm. and also living together right. as a collective and also think about uh, to take about uh, our environment and we came up with the idea of uh, so we have invested uh, with theoretical issues since our since the initial phase and we are we we think that uh, we have brought in the public discourse in Indonesia issues that are uh, deemed new at the time, like uh, small issues like internet cultures, intimacy, emotion, and urban space. And because we think that at the time that was uh, only by engaging in the knowledge production can we uh, we can circumvent like the enemy yeah. in a in a knowledge production that was uh, dominated by the 
by the by the university. Okay. And so we we leverage, we try to leverage that, and also try to uh, experiment with the idea of school, mm -hmm. and try to see uh, school and study in a more you know as a as a way of yeah, yeah. like a as a way of like uh, working with, with with more people. Right. Yeah. Can I can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, like you just moved to Melbourne. Mm. How, um, I, I'm kind of interested in the way that, say, um, Indonesians might approach, say, participatory or socially engaged mm. or community-based projects mm. compared to, say, Australians. Like, can you see any kind of radical, like, lessons we might be able to learn from, you know, like, like from the from the alien sort of outsider perspective you have? My my feeling my my feeling is. Uh, when 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 we you know as a term participatory uh, come up to the uh, art and cultural discourse in Indonesia, feeling is that uh, we we think that we we feel like we are more connected to to that, but uh, not necessarily because uh, we are you know like. A, harmoniously living together as a community but uh, there are like there are other but there are different concepts that that are readily available mm -hmm. that we can just pick up and think that oh this is actually maybe that mm -hmm. people are just uh, seeing that or perceiving that as a as a you know, also as a as a new approaches, mm -hmm. as a new approaches, and so I see that, um, and people see this as a new term, which is also uh, I think it is very very interesting. Whereas uh, at the same time we are, uh, let me rephrase it. I think I think at this stage uh, I um, I think I have to say that uh, uh, this is a time where uh, the people and the state are able to speak like uh, head to head and this is uh, in a in a very different sense with for instance with the condition in a new order era, for instance, where, where people can be uh, mobilized uh, for the sake of the state. Of course, today uh, we can see also different forms of mobilizations, but it works very, very differently. Mm -hmm. So people have a very different sense of uh, what it means to participate so I, I think that that is uh, the main thing uh, that is changing in Indonesia, uh, the meaning of uh, people's participation. Because uh, I don't know, I don't know with the with the like the Australian context, but we are we are so used with the with the idea that uh, that that the state can more mobilize uh, people's labor for free. So the idea of uh, participation, the idea of labor, and the idea of um, the people, that is uh, the main things that are changing. And I don't know whether, like uh, among the artists themselves, whether they, they you know, like really reflect on, on that mm -hmm. and how, how they pick up for their, their works, especially if they are like really say that uh, this is participatory art because uh, I I think like people from you know like uh, different movement from like the nineties like new art movement uh, they can say that oh we can we, we also this is also a new participatory art. Yeah. I think yeah. it's it's interesting because we look at Joe Jakarta as being this extraordinary cultural 
space in, in a very complex world and a very complex country. And I think the fact that you've produced the work that you have um, through a period of, of Sahato and then people from that, there's something about the way in which this idea of participation and community operates in your practice and our other um, colleagues of yours in Jogja that has negotiated the kind of totalitarian conditions that I think we are now fearful that we're about to enter into, both in the States but more broadly in Europe. And I'm really fascinated by the complexity about how you have negotiated that, because you've negotiated that for a long time. It's not as if you live in a kind of liberal democracy like we do. You know, the governor of Jakarta is now under attack because he's a Christian. You know, there feels like there's a backlash in Indonesia that, that's different, but perhaps part of the continuum of what we're talking about tonight. So. I'm, I'm really interested about how you've negotiated that, that notion of community and participation under very complex circumstances for a long time. I think, um, like, Kunji can use the word com community as well as other organizations, like uh, among us, like from my 56 or other people, other individuals and or organizations might use the same words, but uh, what I what I feel is that, uh, and what I think of is that uh, uh, there's actually uh, like a not battle maybe, but uh, like different uh, different concepts of uh, perceiving the idea of community. Uh, but uh, I think in retrospect, I I say that we don't. We don't talk about it, you know. Like uh, we, we don't talk that, or we 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 not actually making like a concrete dialogue of uh, what we actually mean by community. Mm -hmm. And like if, if you say, oh, this is community art, okay, <coughs> what what actually you mean by community art? Or if, if you say, like if House of Natural Fiber say, oh, this is like uh, we making. Uh, something like uh, DIY, blah blah blah, or what actually you mean by that? We we just actually what what we I think we just um, now there are we are actually facing with multiple meanings of community that we are creating, and yeah, but we are not actually talking with each other. Well, we so we worked on a project. Mm loosely, kind of together, which was yeah. um, looking at urban wasteland spaces in different parts of the world. There were 14 different cities involved in that project, and it was really interesting looking mm. at definitions of space. Mm. Um, so we were look, working with uh, what we were calling urban wastelands, which is very kind of flexible to particular spaces in the city. Um, and you set up a twinning relationship between uh, a site in Nottingham, which was an urban wasteland mm. space which was inhabited by dog walkers. Um, uh, kids playing football, people taking drugs, prostitution in the evening, um, and it was kind of uh, quite a complex space, but very open in, in regards to the space. Yeah. Is it Lidoc Lid Lid Timah? Yeah. Lidoc Timah. Um, that had over 40 families in it. Mm. Um, it was fully occupied. The people uh, didn't have legal status in that space, but they'd occupied that space, and it was. I, I hit that thing, you know, yeah. just picked up on that thing you were talking about, how we talk about community. It was like, how do we talk about engagement in those spaces? And um, these two kind of temporary commu communities with very different agendas, very different kinds of stakeholders. And I think it's really important to have, have those conversations. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's where we can kind of learn from, yeah. in, in general, that kind of discourse as well. Um, but not necessarily relevant as well. <laughs> yeah. So it might be a good time to put our video on. Um, we've, we've had our three on-stage presenters, but we have a, a long-distance Canadian presenter who's, who's um, been in conversation with Shannon this afternoon. Brent began um, in the mid-80s uh, by a group of artists who were really found some frustration in the, the lack of diversity in what was being shown in Vancouver. And this wasn't just about cultural diversity. It was about the diversity of media, diversity of, of all sorts of things. Like there were many voices which they felt were not being acknowledged by the greater art community. So in that way, Grunt really did start as a kind of outsider artist gallery. And what that meant was um, it provided opportunities for an awful lot of um, queer artists, artists of color, indigenous artists, performance artists. So it became in the early days a place where you could find um, 
um, yeah, a lot of practices that were that were quite challenging and very weird. And actually, there was a uh, Paul Wong's um, well-known media artist here in Vancouver said that Grunt. Informally, he said to me, Grunt was always the gangly nerd of the Vancouver <laughs> artist community because it was this just this weird space and it was home for a lot of people and it was also really scary for a lot of people. A lot of people just didn't come because it was kind of weird. Um, and over time, I mean, there's been many years between those and that and this one and, and it's really evolved. So that but that challenge that like that interest in representing things differently has never really left the space. Mm-hmm. It's kind of within the DNA. And so as it's as Grunt has evolved, what that has meant is um, embracing the practices in an expanded field. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we want to focus primarily on cultural diversity, for instance, but it might be around like, what is it that artists need now that's not being acknowledged? And what, and, and what we found is that means artists need more time. Artists need more, um, more powerful support for an unruly practice. Artists need more um, ability to choose the, the way their work gets shown. Or artists want to be more involved in the promotion of their work, or they want to do a publication that's not a book. So, I mean, all these things, it's just trying to address these these broad differences. Um, and yes, Grant has always been very, very involved in, um, in amplifying indigenous voices. Um, and that has meant uh, there's always, there's very often been um, indigenous people on our board. Uh, we have um, long, ment- but there's been a strong mentorship component here too. So a lot of really amazing curators have come through. Um, and then of course we show a lot of indigenous artists. So some very, very f- famous shows here in Canada, the Beat Nation show, which is art, Aboriginal art and hip hop culture. Mm-hmm. Um, went through was a was a project which was initiated at Grunt and eventually grew to a larger touring show. Um, so I think as we've and we we in Canada are really noticing since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that there are a lot more discussions, um, really vital, urgent stuff coming out of um, out of uh, Indigenous communities and and for for some could say for the first time people are listening really mm-hmm. widely, um, and so. Um, it's interesting to be in this position because there is, yeah, it's an amazing moment. It's, there's a lot of really amazing discussion happening out, out there and, and really like productive political discussion. And I feel like Grunt is in a great position to support that still because we have been and always will be um, very invested in having Indigenous voices part of what we do. So that is definitely, it's, a, it's not in our official mandate, but it is unofficially a deep, deep part of what Grunt has been doing for the last 30 years. 30 something years. So I have a role, my role is curator of community engagement at the Grunt and it began as a one year term. It was as many things at the organization was, it was project funding for one year and they had made this pitch that they wanted to expand um, the idea of community engagement and whatever that meant to the to the organization. And I think when, when, when we first started it was very much around trying to expand um, the idea of engagement to Really look at the structures of the organization, how we ran, how we, how how human resources worked, how the board worked, how our communications plans worked, how we built exhibitions, and what, if if anything, could we do to bring more community engaged practices or more community engagement into that? And what we very quickly learned was that community engagement means very many different things depending on what you're talking about. So I came to it as an artist um, who did have to some degree a community engaged practice, but actually what I'm more, my own work is actually quite different. It's not necessarily in community, but I have an interest um, and an affinity for working with artists to to make a given space um, appropriate to house their work. So what that means is um, I had some experience working at a larger institution creating performance um, in the context of exhibitions and in the context of a particular architecture and and um, and that was that was wonderful. It's just I found that the institu- the way the institution was structured it made it really hard for those practices to be highlighted in any significant way. And it became very much like kind of a series of small performances, whereas I was more interested in kind of longer term projects, projects that were actually really hard to create. So working with artists really closely to bring their work into being was what I wanted to do. And so I'd, I had some experience also working in public art and working to bring temporary public artworks um, through commissioning processes. And so, I mean, in some ways, I found that my art practice and my curatorial practice was very much invested in this process of negotiation. And so when I took the job at Grant, it was, um, we, we kind of, it was a co-exploration of the, of the organization and I 
to figure out how I was going to fit within this structure. And to my delight, they've been incredibly open to how that's happened. And so what we've what we've done is that kind of role has evolved from curating projects. So I work with artists and curate projects in community or curate projects in residencies. Um, but I also have been working with um, the staff and board to do strategic planning around yes. what, if we are to expand and if we are to do a capital expansion in the next five years, what does that look like from a practice-led approach? So um, how do we think of um, a capital expansion differently, knowing what we know now about the importance of engagement and community engagement? So one of the first things that I did with uh, with my role at the Grunt was we were celebrating a 30th anniversary. And so we were interested in bringing artists um, or commissioning works from artists that would look at um, our archive, uh, the neighborhood in which we've resided for the last 30 years, um, and also um, coordinate with a communications uh, director to do a kind of rollout of these different, I guess, artist projects. So one, it, so we kind of approached it at a multiple level. So the first thing we did was um, in, um, invite an artist, Julia Ferrer, um, to do a residency within our archive. And she ended up she ended up doing a project called uh, Kitchen, which recreated in the gallery a um, the old Grunt Kitchen, which was seen as this kind of like place of fermentation for the arts communities that ended up kind of growing up around Grunt. So we were very much invested in this idea of food and that 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 there's this kind of um yeah there's a percolation that happens around um, these social spaces and so we kept kind of going back to the idea of like art is social and then and the growth of art and the growth of the community is an inherently social thing so how do we how do we reflect that in our 30th anniversary and from there we ended up moving towards um looking at the neighborhood and thinking about how um it has shifted and changed over time and it's become this kind of like there's a lot of breweries around us now so we ended up creating these what we were calling social objects, um, which would um, acknowledge that these objects that were created by artists could be put into the community to be used and circulated widely. So we work with two artists, Lorna Brown and Sonia Asu, to create. Um, one was a growler, so it's like a beer jug yeah. that people would go and use, and they return it back to the brewery and get it filled and leave. So they were these kind of like additions that we called social objects that would circulate. And then from there, there was two more projects. One was uh, Future Loss with Zoe Cry which was um, community consultation with um, uh, business owners on Main Street. Um, and then this piece called Shako Club by an artist named Cindy Mochizuki. Um, and she, uh, it was probably our mo most robust community engaged project of that term. And she worked with a place called Tanari Gumi, which is a Japanese um, volunteers association. And it's been in Mount Pleasant, our neighborhood for um, many, many years. And it primarily serves Japanese speaking elders. And Cindy did a, um, a longer term project within within the context of Tanari Gumi, which engaged their commercial kitchen, which um, also invited the public in. Um, it's a quite, quite a complex project, so I, probably, I won't go too much into it now. But um, yeah, so I mean, we, those, that was a year and a half of programming. And from there, a lot of other projects have grown. So it felt like this investment in that um, really led to our acknowledgement of how important the engagement strategies were and how important it was for us to start incorporating these in a more kind of concrete institutional way into how we were planning our future. One of the things that I've always been really um, amazed about is the kind of steadfast support of these kinds of practices mm -hmm. that Grunt has had over the years. And also that Grunt has had, well, it hasn't been an, an overtly activist or political mm -hmm. mandate. It has acted as a kind of amplifier for um, artists and voices that have not been generally accepted within the mainstream. And so um, now, I mean, it's, I feel like we're, we're probably in a similar spot in terms of how we're envisioning yeah. the institution because um, we're really looking at using our stability and making it more clear and explicit uh, to the arts community what, our, what we feel our function is. And yes. part of that is very much about um, going into community, doing uh, works that are not necessarily engaged, not necessarily rooted so much in the white queue. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll always do exhibitions and that's always going to be part of what we do. But um, we're absolutely, um, I think our area of growth is going to be around creating opportunities for artists to work within community and within different contexts. So that's, that's like that for us, that, that means that's capital expansion. So we're tra having like big questions around what capital means in that, um, in that context of how do we start crafting uh, a future for the organization that feels like um, true to how we want to expand. The work that we do is so much about subtlety, is so much about addressing people where they are and about giving artists opportunities to make their work in the way that they need to make their work and to allowing people 
I mean, that is in a way, I guess what we're working towards is self-definition and agency. So how do we as institutions give agency in, to, our, to our constituents, whoever they may be, artists or curators or audiences? And to me, that is incredibly important, especially now. So, I mean, I know it's kind of soft politics in some ways, you know, like, and, and I think we also need to be out in the streets and out in, on the front lines and giving our money and our time to people that are doing frontline work. And that feels very vital to me as well. But the thing that I've been sort of comforting myself with in the last week is that it is so important that we are listening closely and trying to be tender with each other around these practices. Because to me, these practice, as practices are so much about communication, kind of eye to eye, and about um, creating places that are safe for art. And that is, we are going to need that so much in the next few years. Oh, just my turn. Um, just to comment on something that I noticed that well, the question that you asked, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Noni. Noni, the question that you asked Noni about what can we do here in Australia is. I think they're doing in Job Jakarta. Um, and it seems to me that in Australia as artists, we don't, um, largely, we don't organise as, like we're, we're very much into temple, temporary and temporal organisations. We don't cre we create artworks that are rather temporary or they're, or they're temporary in nature that you view them and then you walk away from them or whatever. We don't tend to organise in ways where we're organising longevity or community, not just community, but spaces in that way and that maybe that's something we can get from the Jakarta experience. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. about what's going on there. I can directly answer. Yeah, that's an interesting observation because uh, I, I, I realised that, oh, actually uh, not only my organisation but also other friends are thinking about you know purchasing lands <laughs> purchasing land for you know to build like a concrete space rather than keep renting space uh, which was increasingly uh, expensive so uh, that's that's uh, my uh, short way of thinking about longevity so because clearly um, uh, we, we, we do think about you know, the future. Uh, we do think about um, what, we, what, we, what we can do next. Uh, but uh, we, I'm also, we at, at Punchi, for instance, we, we are, we tend to question about, uh, you know, uh, the situatedness of uh, the production of our thoughts, and we we try <coughs> we we are like uh, when Amy asked me about participatory art. I I actually I my it it feels so familiar um, for us, uh, but we 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 cannot answer how. How can the concept like participatory art becomes, you know, immediate, immediately sound familiar for us? Maybe because uh, I think uh, the idea of uh, thinking about a nation or art for the community and for the people has been going on for a long time for Indonesian art artists. We can actually trace back from from books like how how these are like important keywords for Indonesia uh, thinking about uh, thinking about the country thinking about the people and also the, the long division between for instance like Jogja school and Bandung school Jogja is always being uh, like a more more political concise artist whereas like Bandung school is more theory driven so we are we are we we are thinking about that and and to relate to the idea of school we also don't want to you know like uh, be romantic about it uh, 
we are we we realize that uh, what is important is actually to uh, I would say create the condition where we can nurture like a improper thoughts or <laughs> the idea. Yeah, I think that's that's what is more important in a context <laughs> like like us, like uh, nurture or create a situation where we can uh, be unsettled or or you know. Uh, yeah, so that's 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 what we thought of when we come up with the idea of creating the school. So this is actually, uh, uh, we are we invite people to uh, join us, like uh, in a situation that we create to unlearn about a lot of things, uh, because uh, we think that. Uh, only by you know nurture this kind of improperness step that we can make sense actually all the you know like the the crazy thing around us and then think of like a proper strat strategies like a, yeah or how to I I'm, I'm not I'm not comfortable with the word coping but kind of like a, just you know, maybe dealing with that, yeah. I think it's a really great question because I think what kind of underpins it to some degree is another of the dreadful aspects of the CCP closure is it's closing down that collective because I think the CCP mm -hmm. was an amazing collective of people that were networkers and supporters mm -hmm. of one another. And I think the other thing that's really interesting about that is that, you know, there's a whole history historically in the 20th century of artists' unions, like in the States in the 60s and 70s, they had an art workers' union. Um, and that was proposed in the Vietnam War and a whole assortment of different things. I mean, in Australia, what's the thing that knits us? I mean, we've got NAVA, National Association of Visual Arts, that I subscribe to, but you'd hardly see it as a, a sort of art workers' union. And I think it's a terrific question. What is the organisational structure that knits us or can knit us together in, in this particular context, Amy? Well, I, 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 I mean, it's funny because having, I mean, we've just been running a campaign to save the CCP. And I've had a very real experience of what it's like to campaign and organise. And that you're constantly confronted, like someone who's, I'm six months out of my PhD, my scholarship's about to run out, and I found myself working full time fit five, for five weeks to try and save CCP. And there was about six of us faced with this problem of us going, we want to put all our energy in because we know we can, like, we can change their minds. There's, not, there's precedence for this too. The Willen Centre was under threat a few years back and they managed to fight back. But we had this situation where we couldn't get solidarity from the staff because the staff were industrial disputes with the, with, um, with the VCA so they couldn't publicly come out in support of our campaign. And we had lots, lots of students, CCP students especially, who wanted to help us, but they were busy at home finishing their PhDs or their masters or whatever. And to be honest, the campaign was extraordinarily dishearten disheartening in the sense that we were so precarious. People's, people have children to look after, they have jobs to do, they've got studies to finish, they don't have time to take, like, to take out to fight for the things they believe in. And I think that that says something kind of upsetting about our particular situation that we're faced with in Australia. I mean, Ben Eltham's platform paper um, that came out recently says something similar, that the Australia Art um, Council cuts happened with very little resistance from the arts community. And the arts community, unfortunately, has forgotten to organise, but I also think it says a lot to, about the fact that artists don't have stable incomes. We're all, we're all kind of worn out already. And I, I do think this is something we need to think about really carefully, about how we can create these forms of solidarity and sustainability around our practices and fighting back when there's all these cuts to our, to our livelihoods. But we have to be realistic. People, people have to work. People have to pay the rent. Mm. People well, have to cover the, the rent kids. is like, just increasingly becomes a thing that I'm interested in and, and artists voice it against, yes. against development or against um, you know, rising rent prices, rising studio prices. Um, you know, we have a studio down the road and it's now got nearly 30 people in it and it used to have 10. And uh, we're all realised that we're now running a studio building because we had to set up an organisation to run it and um, it takes up a lot of time. Nothing's got better, we're paying more rent and it's taking more of our time. Um, 
and uh, yeah, I think that that is something that'd be really interesting seeing people being more vocal on, on the development stuff. Do you have any thoughts on that, or extend that that idea any further about potentially this idea of a collective organisation that actually operates in such a way to be able to be a, a source of resistance for Amy and colleagues at CCP or other spaces we find ourselves in? I mean, this idea of the collective and organisation seems to be a really profoundly important one because I don't think we quite know what to do. No. I don't think we quite know the formations that we require. But I think we do believe that they are required. So, who's got some thoughts on that? Anything they want to share? I was just going to comment just in terms of solidarity. I mean, it's coming back to Will's point about cheap rent affordability. I think it's important. I don't, I don't come from the, directly the artistic community, so it's interesting the conversations I hear, but I always try to unlock a lot of this way of thinking by reaching out in solidarity to other organisations, other institutions, other disciplines. Mm -hmm. For when I think about affordability in the city of Yarra, there's a city of Yarra. Um, committee that, that I'm on which looks out to try and get creative infrastructure within the city of Yarra. Mm -hmm. So there are people here in, in government trying to work on these issues. So I think you know it's bridging outside of the discipline and looking outside for solidarity maybe a bit clues there. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean like CAP as well, you know, yeah. they, that's the very nature of that is to be an arts incubator. Um, yeah. yeah. Someone was about to say something over here I heard. Oh, oh sorry, I was just gonna say it's ironic um, that we don't like have time to organise because we are trying to pay the rent and mm. all that. And that's exactly why people get together and organise because they are trying to pay the rent and mm. kind of maybe, yeah, it's just that the way we perceive. It's a chicken and the egg situation. How much pressure do we need to be put on before we just go, like, yeah. I don't know, start rising or something? I mean, yeah. It does yeah, feel like yeah. we're in that. Someone, someone said to me recently, where like Australia's about to face its kind of Thatcher years, you know. Yeah. And you know, there's always that glib thing where like the Thatcher years was the best time for punk music or something. Like, you know, perhaps we'll see this artistic resistant flour resistance flourish or something. But I, mean, I hate the idea that we need to like have more struggle to be, you know. In regards to paying the rent, I grew up in um, South Australia where. Uh, John Dunstan in the 70s, I think it was, introduced a housing program for artists where artists um, only had to pay 10% of their weekly wage and they earned, you know, that week a $50,000 grant was capped at $500, so, um, and they would be given that house for life, which is still going, called multiple changes in government and that housing program. My cousins are currently benefiting from it. And just so jealous, but not prepared to move back to. There's a limit. There's always a limit. But I think it's an interesting proposition, and there's no reason why it couldn't be looked at as a solution for Victoria as well. Empty apartments that are being set on. So. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting time for us in Victoria because the the housing bubble has meant there's so much money flowing through the government coffers because of stamp duty. And that's actually trickled down at organisations like Creative Victoria, which is playing a lot of cash in the arts. So on one level, we can look at it and think, well, things aren't too bad in Victoria. Yeah. But I think we need to not delude ourselves. I mean, I use an example of um, the Netherlands about four years ago. One of the greatest public art organisations ever developed was a group <coughs> called SCORE in the Netherlands. Yeah, okay. Fantastic organisation. And before they blinked, they were gone because they changed government and they cut funding by the, to the arts by 50%. And an organisation that had spent 20 years building up rich kind of contexts and ways of operating and nurturing of our practice was gone in a blink. And I think the broader point is, is that we could delude ourselves that the kind of money washing through Victoria is in fact a kind of security blanket mm. when we could be that in three or four years' time as well. And I think it's the sense that... There is, there is affluence, there is comfort, and then there is the abject reality of something that's the other to that. And I think that the art community generally isn't quite prepared for what might be transpiring, or at least I'm putting that on the table, that's potentially the case. And maybe I'm being too conspiratorial, but you know, this is the moment in time now where we need to be thinking about the nature of what it is to organise. Um, Just as a parallel yeah, thought to that, money, yeah. often ways to transcend political cycles is to write things into rules and legislations and policy documents. Mm. So if you go back to housing affordability, like at the moment, lots of local councils are trying to think about, okay, we're reaping lots of money from developers, so a certain percentage has to go back to art. Can we not do plonk art or different types of art, but can we have affordable presentation spaces and housing spaces as well? Mm. So now is the kind of time to put pressure 
on government to actually change these regulations, and you'll find that these will last for 10, 20, 30 years or so, um, and not disappear as political cycles change. That's really great. Yeah. 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 Who else has got some thoughts or ideas? We've had only a small smattering of, of chatter from the audience. Let's try and expand our horizons. What's burning in your stomachs out there, people? It's as much about the spaces that you need to create to have these conversations in as well. And mm. like, um, this is just a, like a, a little taster today. You know, it feels like um, it's not the almost the best scenario to have those kind of conversations. Why is that? Just because it. Um, just because no one's talking. I'm not saying you shouldn't push for it, but I'm just saying, like maybe it's about the, you know, it's about creating those spaces where we can have the longer discussions mm -hmm. um, to be able to kind of really unpick that, and there's that kind of less pressure. But I guess the question is, is no one talking because yeah. they're confused or uncertain, or there's generally <coughs> not the degree of concern that I'm potentially projecting back out? Yeah. No, or I mean, I mean, projecting as well. Absolutely, that concern. Yeah. 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 Zone. I think you like to identify that it's hard to uh, it's hard to shake oneself out of the artist the, the, the presentation in a gallery space. Which mm. I guess I'm familiar with we're back and forth discussion is it's hard to jimmy out of people at the end of a presentation. So I wonder if, if in terms of that the understanding of context where it may be very different when instead of everything hosts an event and there's much more about you know there's food involved and there's constant kind of or when something's coming in Pachi or these kind of spaces where the presentation is not such a, a, a kind of a heavy um, mode. Mm. So just throwing that into the mix, that's really interesting as you create more spaces for this kind of chat. I do understand that. I think it's an interesting um, like situation that people are all talking about in much are more intimate context mm -hmm. and there needs to be this mobilisation of the larger group but it's quite particular because when people are talking about their own precarity to be kind of like poised this question like what do we do now, mm -hmm. what do you want to do now for this group to answer becomes really heavy and it is kind of more rather like for example, like I found what Tim just said really interesting about how we have to be talking to the local government, um, and it's like that is like this very real change we can be doing rather than being like, okay, abstractly, what do you want to do and what are we going to do? And I, like I quite agree with Shannon in that, it's like in the circumstance of this sort of panel discussion where it's like, okay, so come to the panel discussion, maybe with a question for a particular panelist rather than inciting a back and forth with everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, that wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's an observation. No, no. I mean, I think something I got out of the video was she was talking about uh, the grunt gallery trying to amplify certain kinds of activities that they saw the artists were doing but the gallery wasn't necessarily taken care of. And I think it's great, for instance, like when I had a chat to Shannon about bus, bus has, has identified that they want to start making uh, as a sort of a, a larger public programs that sort of help helps artists who are engaging the community or doing stuff offside. Um, so in terms of like, I mean, I guess that's kind of like maybe the the more direct question that the audience might like to have is like, I guess for me when I think about what do I want amplified, I mean, I don't, I I don't I like perhaps I do agree with Ben Elton that perhaps we were ill-equipped um, during the Australian Council cuts to kind of come together, but maybe we need to be asking, say, our artist-run spaces, um, the galleries that support us, the universities that support us, the, the various institutions that we're connected with, that they need to be producing more political kind of programs or more, uh, you know, opportunities for us to politicise, you know, give us space to have more discussions. Um, That's what I find um, when you mentioned Squall before, because I used to live in the Netherlands, and. Um, most of the institutional spaces offer space around issues, mm -hmm. not around uh, group show work or individual mm -hmm. show work. It was always around issues. And organizations like SCORE or CASCO were actually uh, putting forward issues that were important to society. Also, the Dutch government would fund based on issues important to their economy and society as well. Mm -hmm. But with these, I, I think it's really important for a, an organization to be able to, and that's what's great about this, is that it's reactive, you know, that, and that there's a space to be reactive. And I find that there's a lot of institutions that just can't do that because of the funding structures that are expected to project, you know, three years ahead. 
Um, yeah, was that in the case? Yeah, right. I was just going to say, in the case of the Netherlands stuff, was there a sense of you were saying was like a. There's actually a direct relationship between issues that were important to. The projected kind of. Yeah, projected. Like yeah. Kind of, yeah. Like potentially, this is the yeah. point though. We ask, we ask these spaces to kind of project into the future that you need to have programming mm. that is responsive. So you've yeah. got a little time scheduled for the responsive shit storm yeah. that's probably yeah. likely yeah. to happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like. Yeah. How to make your own gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting that I think a couple of the your comment was a really interesting one about alternative art school models because we're really it's not our focus tonight, no. but I do think the idea of alternative educational models mm. as art school gets more expensive, as art school gives you less contact hours, as you have more and more overworked lecturers, and places like the states where they turn out a quarter of a million fine arts graduates a year, you start to wonder what is this economic system that's known as the art school. And, and what are these alternative models? And how might they function to start to build some of those community connections that are, that are potentially being dissipated? And CCP is an example of that, but there are others as well. But I, I wonder, Shannon, whether a part two to our conversation is about alternative art school models or, or alternative models that could be another means of building collective agency. It seems just as a, as a note not to derail, but that yes, that I mean, it's interesting when we talk about um, artist run organisations in Australia, artist careers in Australia, and how those um, how those uh, expectations are built at art school often, um, and how they affect the institutions that these artists build. So, bus projects is an artist run space, and the, and the suite of other spaces that are artist led, artist run. Uh, the reason they operate in a certain way is often because of artist careers and the way that these spaces view their spaces helping those artists' careers to grow. And so, I think. Uh, a lot of that is integrated with how people study, how they understand the art world, and there, um, I think a lot of the where where it does happen is by the the luck of your lecturer and your tutor. If they build a fire in in terms of, of the type of practice you can make, you see those people go out into the world and be great. Um, you know, uh, they do whatever they end up in. They they end up you see them uh, act in a certain way. But I think that. The notion of the the, um, the influence of art school on the arts community is, is an interesting question to ask. Folks, we're kind of slightly over time, but that's not an issue. If, is there still um, a bit of love in the room to keep the conversation going? Is there anyone that just... We certainly have a lot of beer on ice as well, so you know, there is a lot to do here. You know, to get through all of that. We can collectivise individually over a beer. That's it. <laughs> But, I, I mean, my call I guess to us is to yeah. keep these things going and um, right. let's find, you know, because it, it was a panel discussion before and now it's a round table and it seems like it's getting <laughs> more. <laughs> let's find it. We'll build any up. And maybe it's about people bringing forward concerns so that, they, that everyone's kind of coming with something. Um, yeah. Yeah. And know, I think, you know, whereas the last one was, was held with the people in the room and we've recorded this and... Um, I think that hopefully people, even if they're not in the room now, can, can hear all the perspectives that people have brought forward, which I think have all been quite inspiring, I think. So, um, and hopefully we don't let that be the end point. And, and you're right, a, a follow on from these things, whether it's here or whether it's another organisation, or I think uh, continuing this is, is probably important. Yeah. So, a massive shout out to Shannon and Nina for organising tonight. And, um